welcome to episode 110 of Destination Linux. This is a podcast of opinions made up of four of the greatest minds ever discussing our passion for Linux. I'm Rob, and with me today are two podcasting Goliaths. Mm. Michael, how are you this week? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good, thank you. And Ryan, how are you? I'm doing amazing. I have a Radeon 7 in my machine. Wow, nice. But where's, but where's Noah? You can help here. Answers to comments at destinationlinux.org, and the best reply will get read out by Noah next week. <laughs> Nice. You all guess where Noah is, and we'll read it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so, Michael, what have you been up to this week? I have been working on improving the podcast and the recording and everything, and hopefully we won't know until this is over, but I'm pretty sure that I have fixed the volume issue with my uh, sound versus everybody else's sound, so we should be good to go, and no extra e effort in editing for me this week. Well, okay, for that particular piece. Excellent. Sounds good. So, Ryan, what kind of things have you been doing with your Radeon? Well, I released the first video on the Radeon 7, so folks can go check that out where we give overall impressions. And we'll be having my brother over today to start doing some of the videos that we wanted to do with regards to seeing how well it does in things outside of just gaming. But how about game development? How many polygons we can throw at this thing? So we'll have that video out next week for everybody as well. And then I have converted all of my sh machines at the house to Arch. So I am fully in Arch now. Every single computer I have is now full Arch. That's how much I've been loving it. Arch is the way to go. It's the new life. But I also changed up something else that Michael's not going to be happy about. I switched to Budgie from KDE on all the machines as well. It's just out of my way. And I like it. So I have been using Budgie and enjoying it a lot. So all of my machines are now Arch Budgie. So there you go. I mean, it's okay. It's not It's not a bad choice. It's just not the yeah. plasma choice. So it's not the correct choice. That's, that's, <laughs> but other than that, it's okay. And we all know, knew Michael was going to say that. So that's two of us <laughs> on Arch this week because I'm on Salient OS. Going to get a whirl for our friend out there, Silent Robot, seeing how it goes. And it's so far so good. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API. Multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. You can get all this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. Or you can use their flexible pricing structure for as low as 0 0.7 cents per hour. That's darn near free, Ryan. Indeed. DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. They're so simple in the way they describe things. It, it, it's really great. You can get started on DigitalOcean for two months free with a $100 credit by going to do.co forward slash DL. Now you can use that $100 credit to try out a bunch of their small droplets or some beefy droplets. If you want, you can even test run with their beefy. Now these stats are just ridiculous. It's a 16 gigabyte 6v cpu droplet to get started with this fantastic company go to do.co forward slash dl before we get into the email we just want to take, give a special thanks to everyone who has supported the gofundme page to bring zeb to america for self so you've raised over a thousand dollars in fact i think right now it's at 1111 so good binary right there mm -hmm. and uh this of our two thousand dollar goal uh, so that the, the total cost of the like the planes, the hotel, and everything to get Zeb over here, and it's it's incredible that everybody has put pitched in so much to help us uh, accomplish this goal. Um, the page is still up for anybody who'd like to con also contribute to bring Zeb to Self. Uh, so if you're not aware, uh, if you, maybe you're just now starting watching the show, uh, Self is at the Southeast Linux Fest, and we were trying to get like basically all three of the American hosts are going to Self this year, and we're trying to get the uh, English host to also join us and uh, as you might can imagine that's a pretty expensive flight so we're trying to raise the money to get people uh, to be able to get Zeb here so if you would like to we would very much appreciate it and uh, we'll be doing a live show 
Uh, either way, but hopefully we can have Zeb to be joining us to do a live show along Noah with his uh, Ask Noah show. And we'll also be doing some live streaming where we give Zeb some tips about how to be an American and the best <laughs> ways to uh, drive on the proper side of the road and all kinds of things. We're going to so, get him a big American flag t-shirt and pants. Yes, and yes. yeah, we're just going to deck them all out. Exactly. And, and, yeah. uh, and the hat and everything, just completely everything. So anyway, if you'd like to uh, help us uh, accomplish this goal, or you can go to destinationlinux.org slash Zeb to self, Z-E-B-T-O-S-E-L-F. Or for those in not in America, Z-E-B-T-O-S-E-L-F. Okay, Ryan, so can you tell us about our email this week, please? Well, we got a fantastic email from David this week. It was very long, so I had to do some editing and take some stuff out. But there are a couple moments in here that I truly, I had to share with Michael because I just I just laughed out loud on here. So greetings, podcasters. Before I ramble a bit about my own experience with Linux as requested, I want to tell you how much I enjoy and learn from your podcast. Before I found Destination Linux, I was choking down a few other Linux-related podcasts to get information, but it wasn't particularly enjoyable. They were either too far on the technical sysadmin developer end of things and dry or just a bunch of seemingly biased opinions without much news or substance. I believe that you four have achieved the perfect balance of humor, information, and technical know-how, and your content is geared much more towards users, super users, than people administering large networks for a living. By the way, that compliment wasn't the funny part. The funny part's coming up. The funny part is, of course, you guys have plenty of biased opinions. And then in quotes, cough, cough, Ryan is an AMD fanboy. That's true. And then hashtag KDE makes Mikey squeal. (laughs) <laughs> which, all right, <laughs> this is very true. By the way, there is a reason, is there a reason Noah doesn't have a spot on the DL contact page? I have fixed that to Michael's horror. I have gone out and added Noah to the contact page. I did it fantastically. Michael said it was the best HTML code he has ever seen. Mistakes have been made. <laughs> but it's there now. So Noah, you can, Noah is officially on the page. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, He goes on to talk about his use uh, with Linux. He's a physician working in a large health group. group. Uh, Unfortunately, has no say over IT matters, but was pleased to find a few years ago that his workstation office and hospital started booting into RHEL. He first started in Linux around 1995. Uh, He found other tools had been, you know, terribly expensive and difficult. And then he found Linux, of course, like a lot of people, and was able to, um, you know, be able to code and do the work that he needed to do with no costs. And his first distros were Red Hat and SUSE. Since then, he's now has uh, machines on Pop! OS, Antergos, and Raspbian. And his desktops are GNOME as his daily driver. And I thought this was interesting because he listed out stuff that he's learned on DL so far. Some of his favorite things are the fish shell. Now that I get annoyed whenever I have to use Bash, and I agree, it's like the greatest thing ever to use the fish shell. So if you have not checked that out yet, do so. It's now come one of those things that I install when I'm doing a new machine almost immediately. Uh, Nextcloud, of course, that one we've talked about a lot. Absolutely love it. Thunderbird, you. Yeah. Steam Play uh, to play some games on there. Team Fortress 2 and Portal 2, as well as Doom 2016 with Steam Play on. Vim there. You see that, Zeb? Vim. Another brilliant, beautiful Vim user in the house. And uh, the pseudo exclamation mark, exclamation mark, or as Michael would say in his country, bang, bang. Yes, bang, bang. It's not necessarily my fault. I didn't name it that. Anyway. I like how he says this email was much, much longer. And he says, how's that for a core dump? Don't send this email to Michael. It will (laughs) fill up his drive and crash his system. (laughs) Anyways. Thanks again for all you guys do. I really think this is the best links related podcast out there by far. I've dropped my subscription to the rest except Ask Noah, which I'll listen to if I have to. Just kidding, Noah. Keep up the great work. I really enjoy it. David, David, thank you for sending such an awesome email. Also mixed with lots of humor in there. Absolutely loved it. Nice. The thing I like about it, I think this is possibly the second or third email we've had from somebody in the sort of like the physician type trade, doctors or whatever. Mm. And they're, and they're all out there using Linux. It's, it's, it's incredible. I yep. just wish the UK's National Health Service would use Linux instead of, uh, <laughs> yeah. instead of Windows 95. <laughs> nice. Okay, so we still want to hear from you, our listeners. So send us an email this week. Ask that burning question or simply give us some feedback. Send your email to comments at destinationlinux.org. So first up, we have some distro news. 
Ubuntu 1804.2, or is that 18.04.2? Never quite sure how to say that. I always just say 1804.2. Yeah, I know it's not technically accurate to what it says, but like, eh, it's, it's fl- yeah. it flows better. It's if we've made up our own words before on this show, we can do <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. But, it, but it actually surprisingly comes along with a, a whole host of bug fixes, which is really, really good uh, to, to find out about. So it's fixed a bug which prevented the login screen from appearing on early generation Intel GPUs, uh, Core 2s and Atoms. It fixed a memory leak in Nautilus. It fixed an OSK bug preventing uppercase letters being entered. It fixed a bug where two instances of an application were launched if you touched on the dock. It updated Firefox, LibreOffice, and Thunderbird. And it also fixed a bug which caused the dock to show on the lock screen, which could have been a little bit um, worrying because if you then clicked on that something on the dock, no doubt you could launch something within the system. So it's good to see that they finally fixed that. So it's also good to see that in, in this particular um, release, there hasn't been any major new elements. It looks like they've been concentrating on fixing things that people have, have, have noted. Um, and certainly that one with the live, the dock causing it on the lock, showing up on the lock screen. That could be very naughty if one of your, your docks was a, a, a terminal or God forbid you put a root terminal icon on there. They could sort of create all sorts of havoc. Yeah, that'd be bad. Well, don't put root terminals in your dock. That would be a good start. The other, the the other piece though is Michael. We had a discussion this week in, about GNOME, and mm-hmm. you were kind of giving me some information that I found fascinating, and I think our listeners might as well. But before we quite get into that, I wanted to talk about the memory leak bug that gets fixed here. So maybe it's just coincidence. Maybe it's just me. I haven't gone and done a scientific study to look up all the news on and patching to compare it against other desktops, et cetera. But it seems that GNOME definitely gets a lot of press for memory leaks. And we see a lot of patches related to memory leaks. We see notes coming out about you know upcoming work. It's always, hey, we're going to work on memory leaks. And then when we see things that are actually patched, it's, hey, we're working on these memory leaks. It just seems there's a lot of memory leaks going on. Is this a GNOME thing? Is this just coincidence? Well, the, What's going on here? The issue is that um, every DE has these types of memory leaks. That They happen. They seem to be happening more frequently for, for GNOME than it is for other DEs. Uh, but also there's more of an obvious thing because the, the GNOME desktop uses the most uh, resources for all DEs, so it's more obvious when they have a memory leak because it's it it's more than like just a regular user. You could like even people who have like powerful machines could notice a problem of it slowing down because the way it's built it uses uh, web technologies like JavaScript and their own custom like CSS structure. So because it uses these technologies, if there is a memory leak, those things could load slower and therefore load the shell slower, and you would notice it easier. So people might it might seem like they do it more often and they might even because of the way their process thread is built, but it's mostly because of the way it's built on JavaScript and that kind of, that, those kind of technologies that it's more obvious to people. And then people talk about it more often. And, and also because they're that one uh, memory leak that happened a couple months ago. I don't remember, I don't remember exactly when it happened, but it was a few months ago and it was a pretty big uh, memory leak that would just constantly continuously add more and more processes until usage. you rebooted you yeah. basically had to reboot to fix yeah, it I remember, exactly remember so yep. like in those cases um like it, it's it's getting a, it's this i think it's the only de that's had a, like that high of a um you know noticeable problem that it was got that much attention to it on a memory leak uh, so i think that's why we notice the rest of the memory leaks more often but they all have in some way some kind of memory leaks it's just usually not as noticeable yeah, and the other thing that's interesting with this is it, I, I wanted to ask you, so Budgie, for instance, is utilizing portions of GNOME 2, and so is Mate, as I understand it, right? Prior versions of GNOME? No, no, no. They Where, use, uh, G, they use uh, GTK2? GTK3. They, um, okay. Uh, Mate and Budgie are both GTK3 based. However, um, some of the GNOME stack is used for Budgie, but it's not a fork of GNOME or uh, based on the shell or anything. Uh, Mate is the same way. Mate was a fork of GNOME 2, but they have upgraded all of their toolkit structure for GTK 3. 
And there is some kind of usage of the, the GNOME stack in Mate, but I'm not really sure how much of it is. I think there's more, it's more obvious that you can see the, the, the usage of the stack in the system settings for Budgie, for example. Like, they're, it's very similar to the way that the So since GNOME they're is. all on GTK3 now, does that mean all of them benefit from bug fixes like this? Memory leak issues? Not in the GNOME shell, they... no. Because okay. if unless they're using the GNOME shell, it doesn't matter because GTK and the GNOME shell are separate things, um, pretty much extent, like completely. Because one, the GTK is for applications, and, and also they can be used. It can be used for panels and everything for a shell if you wanted to for a DE. But by default, the GNOME GNOME three shell does not use GTK for the shell itself. They have all the elements outside of the, the DE is. GTK based. So the issues that they happen with the shell and the things that they fix are not related because like Mate, for example, does use GTK3 for their panel and everything. Gotcha. And then lastly, I think this is interesting for people because some, you know, there is some kind of, uh, there's groups out there that don't like GNOME. There's groups out there. We get comments today about how GNOME's their daily driver and they absolutely love it. But there was some information we talked about this week I found fascinating, which I had heard, but you had some additional info on, which is the fact that it runs on a single threaded process, meaning if it crashes, it crashes hard. Yes. Because there's, it's not going to take, it's not going to utilize your additional cores. It's not going to utilize your additional threads, and that's not the same across the board with other desktop environments. No right. one's unique in this way. That's true. Um, I, I, Cinnamon also shares the same single processing thread thing, but that's also because it's a fork, direct fork of GNOME three shell. So. Uh, it's basically having the same problem because it's it's essentially the same core design. The other DEs don't have that. They have multi-threading in various different methods, but they all have some kind of multi-threading. The problem here is that the, the the GNOME system of having a single processing thread, it's not even just a core. If you have a, if you have a core that has multiple threads, it's only going to use one thread. And the issue is that when we're transitioning to Wayland, that's a bigger problem in the future than it is now. So... Let's say, for example, let's compare the KDE Plasma structure and the way that uh, GNOME is. KDE Plasma is very modular and it's and it's multi-threaded. So let's say, for example, I actually had uh, KWIN crash a couple days ago. Uh, I forgot what I was doing, but it was probably my fault anyway. Um, but um, when KWIN crashes, it crashes, flashes for a second, and comes back immediately. You don't have to do anything. It's just back. So it's because it's compensating uh, it's making it's moving everything to another thread so it doesn't lose any of your work or anything else and then brings it all back once they relaunch kwin so it's it's compensating for that automatically whereas in the gnome shell it relies on x to do the compensation so when you crash when gnome shell crashes you can still do alt f2 and then type the letter r and hit enter and it will restart the shell but that's a manual interaction and it's mainly because X allows you to continue to use your system. However, on Wayland, there is no rollover compensation. So if GNOME crashes on Wayland, it's just done and you have to restart your computer. So the, the single threading process thing is going to be more of a bigger problem in the future unless they can fix that. So isn't that something that Wayland should be looking at? No, because it's, it's not. It's gnomes. It? It's gnomes thing that they have to work on. Because I mean, technically speaking, Wayland is just a protocol, and they're not implying that they're going to support all different types of these features. That one of the biggest things about not being able to transition to Wayland yet is because there's a lot of things that people are used to with X that don't exist in mm -hmm. Wayland. So there's this right. issue of you know, for a long time you couldn't even do screen capture in Wayland. Uh, we can do that now, but it's it's it was been a while for you. You couldn't do it, so there was a lot of reasons people didn't want to use Wayland because of these these types of issues that they're so used to with having X and and X being around for so long. It's got so many nice features, but some of these features are done through bad security, and mm -hmm. in a way, um, it's not they're not necessarily like security attack vectors. They're just if you already have something running in your system, you could use these kind of uh, compensation tools that X has to do some malicious things. But overall, um, it's a, a known problem because it was designed to be a single thread process from the start. And I don't really know why they chose to do that because it's the only one that I know of that chose to do it. I mean, I'm not counting mm -hmm. Cinnamon because they didn't create the, the, from the scratch. Uh, it's just, uh, just a weird decision, really, because everything else is modular and uh, multi-threaded. But wouldn't, wouldn't you think that Alt F2 is a pretty fundamental function to have? Yes, um, but the, the problem is that it still has it. It's just 
when the process crashes on uh, X, the Alt F2 activates via X in a separate thing, but not through the GNOME shell itself. The GNOME shell is still just frozen. Mm. Uh, but with Wayland, that's not a possibility. Right. So in either Wayland has to make it possible for Alt F2 to activate separate, or GNOME has to change the way that it activates so that it can be separate. So like maybe if they just did Alt F2 to be a separate process, that could solve the biggest problem, which is the Wayland, uh, the Wayland GNOME crash. Because if it does mm -hmm. crash, you can't use your system. And if you have something that you haven't saved, it's gone. It's just done. So there's a lot of people who have been using, have used it in the past, used GNOME on Wayland in the past, and then was doing all their work. And all of a sudden, the shell just crashed, and they lost all their work because from when they haven't saved it previously. So, like, there's a lot of uh, understandable frustration for people to have experienced that. Um, but if, I mean, I guess if they were to just do the Alt F2 solution to restart the shell, that might work it. Well, they certainly didn't seem to have any of these problems uh, in the film The Matrix. So maybe uh, Gnome should um, <laughs> talk to those guys, you know, in the film industry, and and get some stuff in there. So speaking of the Matrix, so KDE has announced that they're adding Matrix and the, uh, well, Matrix, I think also Riot to their infrastructure for messaging and discussion of all the different projects that they have uh, interconnected. So it's a really cool thing because if you're not familiar with Matrix, Matrix is technically a protocol that allows you to do instant messaging, but also it does chat rooms. It uh, It's kind of like a combination of Slack telegram and irc and a little bit of discord because it has some voice chats as well not so much uh, as it's not really a discord alternative it just had some extra stuff so you could kind of say it's sort of but uh, matrix is cool because it has so many cool features and it allows you to integrate and bridge your matrix rooms with irc and this means it's a much more powerful solution than telegram for example because in telegram you have to use a bot which is not always reliable because if the server goes down for the bot, you're basically done. Whereas the bridge for Matrix is built into the Matrix protocol. Uh, you can activate the bridge to Matrix and IRC, and anything you can do in either will work whichever one you're using. It doesn't matter. So if you have a bot that's in your IRC channel and you have commands attached to it, you could run commands via Matrix. It would send it through the bridge to this IRC channel, and it would work perfectly fine. Like th it's a really cool protocol and I'm really happy to see them adopting it because such a large organization putting backing behind this is really nice because it'll, they're, they're definitely going to test it to its full potential. And uh, previously they were using IRC and telegram and IRC is great. I love IRC. It's not the most user friendly. It's not, it has a barrier to entry. You have to have an, um, an, an IRC client know how to get into these different servers or at the very least have like Kiwi IRC links to every channel you have. You also have to have a list of every channel you have. Then you have Telegram, which is a nice, there's a very small very barrier, barrier to entry as far as using Telegram. Um, but then you have the problem of trying to find out where all the groups are and all the, the decentralized structure that Telegram, because it's not designed to have multiple rooms that are being shared well, between. Well, Telegram's not open source either. And Matrix is completely open source. No, right. I know Telegram's, I mean, Telegram's half, yeah. Or it's supposedly being open source but it's like I'm it's 50 percent open and 50 percent not open i'm guessing that's a big reason why because they said they looked into telegram slack discord as alternatives and i'm guessing that's a big reason why they ended up with matrix and i started playing with this a little bit uh when they moved over and and i i like it a lot like it's mm -hmm. really good especially some of the clients which we'll get into later that are available uh, for the Matrix, which make it really, really gorgeous alternative, looks very modern, that type of thing. So I, I think this is going to be ultimately a really good move. And I think it's going to be a little bit dangerous for things like Telegram out there because, listen, the open source community wants to use things fully open source. I think Telegram needs to probably start taking that other 50% and start working on open sourcing it if they want to be an alternative here. Because when you see big development groups moving over here, support forums, that type of thing, KDE, mm -hmm. if you see other big ones start moving, that's where the people will start moving as well because they're not going to want to be fractured and opening 16 different messaging services to talk to people, mm -hmm. as we've talked about before. And a lot of people just made this migration to Telegram. So I think Telegram, I don't know. This To me, it's a shot call out there that they need to start figuring out how to get their stuff fully open sourced here if they want to remain relevant in the open source community. 
because they have a big following now. But uh, Matrix looks really good, look really promising. Yeah, Matrix is a very powerful protocol, and some some of the clients are really nice, and they look good, and they function well. I think this is they, the KDE team did say that they're going to continue using Telegram for a little while at least to have like a transition period, but they haven't said how long they're going to do that. So it's possible that they, um, you know, you, you could be able to use all of them, you know, IRC or Telegram or whatever. But it's really cool because of the IRC connection. I love the fact mm -hmm. that Matrix makes it an easy approach to using IRC. Because, you know, IRC is a fundamental piece of open source development for decades. And I don't really, I don't want the, I don't want it to go away or anything. So it's nice that when they're transitioning, they're going to be having something that can provide the people who still want to use IRC to be able to use it. But the people who want to use something more modern can do that too, while still having the same chat room. Right. And, and one of the things they mentioned that we didn't touch on too much is the end-to-end -end encryption. Now, this is a work in progress for them. They're still working on this end-to-end -end encryption, making it better, but it's based on Signal's double ratchet algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you want that privacy, that end-to-end -end encryption option is there as well. So they, they kind of are including all the things, all the pieces you would say, if I could create the perfect messaging system, what are the features it has to have today? And that's changed a lot from when IRC was born, right? Of yeah. what we expect to be uh, in these programs. And they're really launching with a powerful presence here. I mean, they're not launching, they've been around, but it's really a powerful tool that they've developed here. All right, next up in the news is Kali Linux. We have released 2019.1. Kali Linux was, um, is the distribution that we talked about with Bo Weaver. It's his go-to distribution for ethical hacking OS. So if you've been wanting to give Kali a try, you can install it now. And one of the greatest features in this release is you can install it now on a Banana Pi and a Banana Pro single board computer. And this is really cool to me because we talked about you really shouldn't be utilizing Kali Linux as a daily driver at all. It's not what it's meant for. But having a machine like a Banana Pi or a Raspberry Pi or one of these machines that you may have spare that are very inexpensive, you can still now install Kali Linux on it and be able to utilize it and then take it completely offline. So if you want to test, do some uh, testing, pen, pen testing on your own network, et cetera, you could have boot up your Raspberry Pi or your Banana Pi, very inexpensive, start doing that and then take it offline so you're not utilizing Kali on your main machine. So this makes it also very portable. I could imagine being able for someone like Bo, for instance, being able to take one of these machines with him to demonstrate things that he can do or to even take it out into a field, into a network room to do testing there. Uh, there are just a lot of applications there. In fact, I'm aware of a telecom company that's utilizing Raspberry Pis that they take with them to do certain integrations with uh, networks that they're testing, et cetera. So just allowing Kali to be installed on these different types of boards, I think is incredible there. So additionally, if you're rocking a Raspberry Pi with a TFT LCD, which I have a Raspberry Pi that I'm bringing to my first Linux and Coffee event here in Georgia. And what I did is I ordered the TFT screen, a whole kit for the base, the screen and everything else. And I'm going to set it in the middle of the table and we can do it as kind of like a project to build in the middle to put something together. So maybe we'll choose Kali Linux as the OS. But uh, so I'll have one of these you can play with if you come to that event. That's but really that's cool. Great. I like the idea because you're providing something for people to do rather than just talk. You're going to actually give like a project for people to participate in. That's a really cool thing. Plus, you don't have to do it. Exactly. <laughs> they build it and I take it home. It's genius. <laughs> that was the whole point, Michael. You nailed it. Um, no, but I think it will be a really fun project for people to play on if they've not had a chance to experience uh, putting together Raspberry Pi or connecting these screens, but they've made this easier to run now. So before you needed to do a bunch of special instructions to basically set up the LCD and the touch controls, now you're just going to type in a simple command. Uh, it's the Calipi TFT config. It'll be in the show notes. Uh, but you run that and basically it'll set up on-screen instructions for you to do all of the work right there. So We've covered how awesome Kali Linux is before and what it can be used for. This is just more updates on that. Um, we also, you can check out if you want more information on Kali Linux, the Bo Weaver interview episode 105 of Destination Linux. And also Ask Noah had uh, him on the show on episode 113 of the Ask Noah show. So you can check that out and kind of get an idea of how uh, a professional pen tester utilizes a tool like Kali. Yeah, definitely want to check out those episodes because it was it was really fun to have Bo Weaver on and uh, hopefully we can do it in the future again. Um, you know, it was a really interesting conversation. You know, Callie is probably the 
you know, okay, guaranteed the most popular distribution for hacking or ethical hacking and right. pen testing mm-hmm. that there is. So uh, it was also it was really nice to learn from the pros uh, how they use it and how like what's the be- the best tools to do the do their job. So definitely check out that episode. So looking back at the article that Michael just talked about with uh, the Matrix client um, coming into KDE, we have Riot releasing their first stable version. Now, Riot has released their first stable version of their desktop software tool that's based on the Matrix protocol. Riot is a decentralized, encrypted, open source messaging software. New features of Riot include new modernized look and branding, simpler options to a favorite channel, end-to-end encryption, which is still a work in progress, but has key backup and emoji device verification. Um, so my, my first question on this, I know we were talking about Matrix and, and how good it really, really sounds, but to me, it's like, really, another messaging tool? We've got Signal, we've got, whatsapp we've got messenger we've got discord we've got ir where does it end where how are we going to entice people to come to this matrix is where it ends because matrix actually integrates to almost everything i mean not everything but a lot and it provides you a single location to do the conversations you want like you can do bridge irc stuff like i said but you can also connect to uh slack um, there's also like, I think hip chat is connected with a bridge and there's some other bridges. I can't remember all of them, but there's a lot of bridges that you can connect all like multiple different chat clients and still, and just use uh, matrix to do it or may use riot, uh, in some cases specifically to do it. And it makes it a lot easier. And they also have like built in bots that you can set up. So let's say you want to have a matrix room and you want to promote an episode of a podcast, perhaps destination Linux, you can have an RSS feed and have the bot automatically uh, post when you have a new episode in that room and the matrix bot is pr- like is provided by the matrix protocol themselves so you don't have to do anything to make it work uh, there's a lot of cool things that matrix provides and a lot of cool integration features that it provides that it could be that single tool to do are we going to move michael are we going to move say, is we already have it one of you two clever guys can set up and show the destination and well, we already have it but are we going to move there officially are we going to well, move the, my goal is to not move is to create bridge structures to for mm-hmm. whatever anybody wants to use you're all going to be in the same chat room we're all going to have the same conversation it's just a different platform whatever platform you want to pick so that's the goal and i'm working on that with a digital ocean droplet that i'm building to con- nice. yeah, Excellent. to connect it where i we're gonna uh, my here's my goal it's going to connect uh irc uh, Telegram, Matrix, of course, also Discord and Twitch chat and some others that I can't remember right at the top of my head. But the whole all idea is to have everything all connected into one chat. And it would also notify you like what chat people are. It would give you like, this is the platform they're using. And here's the name of that person on the platform. So you can have a conversation and know who you're talking to. So it's I think it's going to be really good. If you're going to add Google Plus, you better hurry up because it's going away. <laughs> oh, no, uh, I'm not going to add Google Plus to anything. Yeah, so, don't what, please. Um, I, I I was playing with this, and I actually sat in the KDE room with this tool utilizing Riot, and I really love this tool. It just as a client for Matrix, it's absolutely gorgeous. Everything makes sense. Meaning, you know, one of the frustrations up to your point is with all these clients, you get into a new one, and you have to spend twenty minutes trying to figure out the interface. This is one of those situations where they created an interface that's familiar. They didn't try to reinvent the wheel. They didn't try to hide settings behind other panels and blah, blah, you know, and you just try, where do I go? How do I move to a room? It's a simple interface. But within that, you have all of these controls to be able to do advanced things, but they're in places that make sense. It looks beautiful because if you tell people, hey, come to Linux and then go into an IRC room, and this is, I made a video on IRC back in the 30 days of Linux. And the first thing yeah. is, is like, oh, this is the crappy Linux. You got to sit there in this terminal looking thing to chat. That's how junky Linux comments like that were all the time. And that's just, frankly, people who are ignorant to what Linux is and capable of, that's what they think. But having mm-hmm. these type of modern communication tools and having them look good matters. It actually mm-hmm. matters. It totally matters. And, and when, as soon as the Riot 1.0 comes out, 
when I saw all the stuff that they were doing and I tried out the, the I updated to the, the new Android app and I tried the new web version, it's great. Like it looks so good. It's, it's smooth. It's you know, like creating favorites is easier. Uh, doing uh, like laying out what like your identity that you want to use because you can have multiple identities in write if you want to like this the the end to end, the end to end encryption structure now is super smooth and easy to use because um, they the previous time when you do in pretty much in any kind of key sharing situation there's actually key sharing parties at conferences because for like uh, you know cha- sharing uh, security keys because they're so complicated and they're so annoying to to, hand, to give someone a key over the internet takes forever so you have to you know and these they do these parties at conferences to just hand them a USB with your your public key that way it can they can you know have that for a record uh, when they would just copy it to theirs of course but it, it's that kind of thing that was complicated but the way that they're doing it in uh, riot is through emojis so your key is associated to emojis and there's like six or seven emojis for on one side and all they have to do is to check is looking on their side if the emojis match on both sides then the key's good and it's been accepted so like wow. that kind of thing is really nice because they're taking in consideration of like all the different things that were not very useful or not very easy to use and improving them in a lot of ways so i am actually have been a, a user of matrix and riot for a very long time and i never liked using riot until this release, now I'm excited and uh, happy, super happy. By the way, Michael's emoji, if you want to exchange keys with him, is the smiley face that flips its hair back. That's the one he uses. To- I thought you were going to say just it's just a hair. It's just a just <laughs> a, a, a empty hair, no head, just nothing, just hair. That's what I expected. I love it. Google is now backtracking on their ad blocking, I think, that, that they were trying to do. Like a few months ago, they announced, actually it's just not even that long, but they announced that they were going to change their API for their extensions, which was essentially going to make it impossible for these ad blocks, ad blocking extensions to work. And so it's just, you know, nice to see that Google finally realized not to do something terrible. So uh, they've decided that the backlash from the community was was strong enough and the developers of the ad blocking stuff like Ghosty and uh, Umatrix and Ublock Origin and all the, the, the fact that they were so uh, like upfront and public about how this is going to destroy these extensions. So it turns out that the reason they were doing this weird API decision was that they were trying to claim that it was going to improve their, improve their performance with their benchmarking of serving traffic. Um, and it is important that Google to prefer, improve their performance and also not their excessive resource usage. They should improve these things, but not this way. Not in a way to actually dis- destroy an ability for extensions to exist. That's not a good idea. Um, but on, on the, at least on the bright side, they did decide to change it and compl- instead of completely pulling their plans of the uh, declarative net request API, they're going to give companies time to switch over and um, to change their capabilities before they roll it into it. So they're still going to do it. It's just not going to be like to the point where it's going to destroy they're not everything. Destroy everything in the way of doing it. But here's the interesting thing is. Ghostery specifically called shenanigans on their claims for benchmarking and went out and proved that the delay in serving traffic was under the tenth of a millisecond. So Google was coming in saying basically, hey, we have to do this because of these performance issues. It's causing major problems. Ghostery goes, okay, well, let's check it. Let's put some science. Let's put some facts on that claim that you have there. And the delay was less than under a tenth of a millisecond for them to serve up the traffic back. So they go out there with these shenanigans. Then you have the community and now you see Google backing up going, okay, okay, well, we'll give you time to kind of, I, I don't buy this. I mean, I think they're retracting because of the backlash and because mm-hmm, the claims totally. they tried to make were nonsense. But uh, at the end of the day, I think that it was very obvious to most people why Google was going forward with this plan. Because they're an ad company, for sure. Yeah, and the the ad the particular blocker that just would have happened to work with Google the entire time even after this change is also one that whitelists a lot of Google's ads through as I understand it as well. Mm-hmm. So it, I mean, there's just too many coincidences here for me to go. Oh yeah, this is poor Google was just tr- treated bad. They're just trying to give us faster browsing. I, I don't buy it for a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I, I this is why people should be on Firefox. You know, choose the open source alternative. Zeb, the same thing goes for GPUs. Choose the open source alternative <laughs> out there always. If you're a true patriot of nice. Linux out there, this is what you would do. I agree. The open source is important. You need to embrace the open sourceness. But also, Firefox is just a better browser in general. It's got so many better, better features. It doesn't use so much resources. So just use that one instead. Uh, so, and you can also you, you could use those ad blockers on Firefox without having to worry that the API is going to be destroyed for no reason. So there's that for you. You're delivering facts right to our brains. I love it. Exactly. All right, on to happier news. Digicam 6.0 has been released. And in this release, it is bringing some really cool feature that I'm sure a lot of people are going to love because it now includes video management options. So now you can manage your videos along with your photos right within the tool. So this is, release is a combination of work that was completed during a Summer of Code event and two years of development. So if wow. you go check out Digicam 6.0 right now, you're going to see all of that intermixed in this release. So this is pretty massive. So full support of video file management uh, in there, an integration of import export web service tools like from Lighttable, Image Editor, and Show Photo. Raw file decoding engine supports new cameras. And also with this in the 6.0, that they, they have a new version of LibRaw 0.19, which introduces more than 200 new raw formats. And there is a list like that just keeps scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and Chrome would probably freeze up and Firefox you keep scrolling. And you'd see this list of all the new cameras that it actually supports out there. A lot of the big names and includes phones as well. So your new iPhones are supported in here. Your Android devices are supported in here and DJI, which makes gimbals and they make the, um, help me out here, Michael, the helicopter they, thingies. They make drones. Drones, thank you. Helicopter <laughs> thingy is the official term. But drones, they make drones out there. So now you can take your drone footage and be able to pull that into this tool as well. So I love seeing this because it's supporting basically the whole plethora of the various cameras and, and ability that people use to get video or pictures. And it will be able to organize all of those. And you're not going to have any compatibility issues there. And there's a ton more under this. I mean, it's two years of development. Mm -hmm. So, Michael... Uh, do you utilize Digicam at all? I do. I, I haven't done this as much, but when I want to organize, uh, I'm not really much into photography, but when I organize all the files and photos that I have over the you know many years, I used to Digicam to organize it because it, it's a really nice, clean management tool for uh, video or photos. But then now that they're adding video to that is just awesome because I have a ton of videos, especially considering we make podcasts all the time. I have excessive <laughs> amount of videos, so it'd be nice to... I know, be able to organize all these things. Um, so when they announced this, I was like super excited because the, being able to uh, properly manage your files in a or multimedia files in something like Digicam is really nice to see. And I also like the fact that they're making it possible to export really quickly to these different services like Pinterest and etc. So that's nice. Um, but the the drone stuff is really cool because I'm really happy that like they're adding all these features for the drone support because I actually don't have a drone. But I want one because that's like m one of the most like super geeky to uh, toys that I could imagine. And oh, uh, you don't call it a toy. No, cut, cut, Michael. <laughs> Believe me, I made a video on because I have a drone and I called it a toy that I was afraid to break. People get mad when you call it a toy. Really? They yeah. take this seriously. They're like, this is not a toy. This is a professional piece of equipment. And I guess in a lot of applications, it is. For instance, when I was buying a new house, they used a drone to do part of the roof inspection to pieces they couldn't get on. So I guess yeah. there are a lot of professional applications. To me, it was still a toy, but drone people get mad at that term. So okay. Well, it's I, a I professional tool. I officially retract that statement of toy and say professional tool for video <laughs> surveying, maybe? Yeah, there you go. There we yeah. go. Absolutely. So yeah, it, one of the other cool things in here was the time adjust tool, which is back. So now you can quickly patch timestamps of items. So I can imagine individuals utilizing huge batches of photos. For instance, any photographers out there, they're on a big project and you need to adjust some of the timestamps on there. You can do the, now do this in a batch queue kind of management workflow, which that type of stuff, those type of pro features out there are the things that, you know, really drive usage of a tool like this. They really bring it to that next mm -hmm. level that take it from kind of a, you know, a toy that comes pre-installed with your distro to something that a professional can actually get out there and utilize with their professional drone tool. Exactly. 
<laughs> okay, moving on to some hardware news. And there is so much I could make of this next title. But instead, I'm going to be professional and I'm just going to read it. AMD are hiring 10 more people for their open source drivers. Good job, AMD. Yeah. One of the key advantages of AMD is its open source drivers. Unfortunately, the drivers aren't always flowers and fireworks. I wrote that. That was pretty good. What do you think, Seth? <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah. Wouldn't it have been easy to say, unfortunately, the drivers aren't always that good? But that's not flashy. <laughs> And we yeah, got, we I, was, put, I was okay. giving you some, you know, poetry in there, flowers yeah. and fireworks. I was really stretching my writing skills there, Zeb. So confusion amongst users on which driver to use, along with drivers not supporting the same settings and configurations options, their closed source options. Basically, I think people were getting confused between the normal AMD drivers that come with the system in the kernel and then your AMD Pro drivers and they weren't sure which ones to mm -hmm. use. Is that right, Ryan? So yes, this happens in the AMD community where there is confusion on if you're coming from Windows or any other environment or NVIDIA in your case where you don't support open source and you're not a true Linux lover, um, then what you're used to doing is installing drivers all the time. Well, with AMD, they release these open source drivers out there, but they still have their pro drivers mostly for um, specific professional use cases that people would need to unlock certain parts of the driver assets for their projects. So those are still out there as well. And then there's another set of open source drivers out there uh, that you can utilize as well. So it creates this community developed. So it creates some confusion on what do you do when you get your AMD card? Do you, and what I see in a lot of forums is people going in and installing because we're so used to this going out and installing the AMD Pro drivers. And unfortunately, you're not going to get the best out of your card utilizing that. It, again, it's for very specific applications. It's not for what most consumers would be doing, gaming, that type of stuff. So there is confusion out there that AMD has to clean up uh, that I think would help to kind of show the power of open source in the proper way by not having all of these items and taking all of the stuff that's in those pro drivers and making sure all of that is fully unlocked and open sourced. And they're well on their way towards that. And now getting these 10 additional developers on this is going to help them even more. I mean, this is fantastic that they see this as an issue and are working on addressing it. So it's not something that they thought, oh, let's bring out this new wonderful card. Oh, we forgot the driver. So let's put some developers on it now to fix the situation. I mean, they've always had drivers and they've contributed a ton to open source code, uh, as well as NVIDIA for that matter and, and other Intel and other projects out there. But AMD is one of the higher uh, between the two, obviously, uh, between AMD and NVIDIA as far as their dedication to open source. But having 10 additional people is very, very important for AMD to be successful in this arena. It's also very important from the Linux community, in my, which we talked about a little bit last week as a whole, because we're saying open source is the better way. But the reality is, and we're gonna talk about this in the, in the next article a little bit, when NVIDIA launches something with their proprietary driver, because it's proprietary, it goes in right away. You're gonna have that driver available and your video card's going to work in Linux once you install that proprietary driver. I mean, to be fair, they could totally have open source drivers that are separate packages to install and don't have to rely on the, the kernel, but they they chose to rely on the kernel to have built in by, by default support. They could have an external Ooh. extra piece that says, if you don't have the latest kernel, you could install this and get support. They could totally do that, and maybe these 10 people could uh, at, make that possible. Uh, that's the only, like, there's no reason why they couldn't do that. Um, so, and like, and then what, as soon as the kernel gets updated, you could just remove that extra piece. So, I don't and, know. And that's what I'm thinking when they add these additional developers. Things like that would really take this to the next level because mm -hmm. you want this to be more successful than the proprietary alternative, right? Because we're all making the case yep. open source is better. But if you release a new card and you can't run it in Ubuntu, then that's not really making that case where yeah. I get that new NVIDIA card. I just install NVIDIA's proprietary drivers and I can use it day one in Ubuntu. That seems to make the case proprietary drivers are the better option. We know that's not mm -hmm. true, but that's what a consumer who doesn't understand everything going on behind the scenes or the fact that, you know, when that NVIDIA driver gets updated randomly, suddenly you're not going to be able to boot in your machine and all those type of issues that come on with NVIDIA. 
but this they're not making a great case here because they just don't have it flowing perfectly. Having 10 mm-hmm. more developers, that's a lot of developers to throw at it. It's going to clean things up a lot, I think. But, uh, because- but all joking aside, it's great to see AMD responding like this, and I'd like mm-hmm. to think it would be a response to people's reaction to the Radeon 7 coming out. And like you found out day one, oh, Ubuntu doesn't work. This was a big mistake. Right, boys, let's get some gents and girls in here. Let's start programming this stuff. Let's get it all up to spec and let's get it right. The fact that they have reacted in this way rather than just sit back in on the laurels go, well, you bought the card. We'll wait. We'll get the drivers out to you when we can. They have gone, no, this is something we need to do. And they've moved on it, which is great. Yes. Yeah, and, and the other big problem too with AMD that I'm hoping this fixes is, is you know they're one of the things we talk about in the pro line is the open GL capability. So obviously adding that in so you only have an open source driver would be better, and you don't need the AMD pro line at all. I think that would remove some confusion. But one of the issues is with AMD is they tend to release a card like the Vega 64 is a perfect example. When I first got the card, it probably was more of the equivalent to, I don't know, a 1060, 1070 line. And by the end, it was just incredibly fast. They had locked, unlocked all of this power on this and, and it stomped the 1080 in, in many, many instances, which was its main competitor at the time. And I just loved it. But why did I have to wait so long to unlock all of that power, right? And the Radeon 7 is the exact same case. I can see it now just between the updates, between when I've gotten the card and now it's getting faster and faster and faster. But having more developers on hand is going to hopefully, I'm hoping, help them to unlock the power of these cards much sooner. Yes, that'd be awesome. And just a a quick note about the, the NVIDIA thing. Uh, the argument of in, in proprietary versus open source, uh, you know, ta- uh, driver stack. Um, we could say that it's you know they have the, there's a benefit because they have the separation thing. However, I would like to point out that prior to AMD pushing Nvidia, when you had a new hardware come out for Nvidia, you were waiting a year before they cared at all to give you the drivers. That's a so, great point. so like even though they're now doing it really quickly. Before AMD did any of this open source pushing, Nvidia didn't care, and like when we'll get to it when we get to it. So mm-hmm. even if you don't like uh, in AMD as far as like hardware goes or whatever, you still have to give them a little bit of credit to making Nvidia better for you. Speaking of Nvidia, maybe being better uh, for you, I guess. But in this particular instance, they launched the GTX 1660, which is a newer card from the 2080, which is a newer car from the 1080, so they go from 10 to 20 to 16. That makes a lot of sense. I understand completely. <laughs> totally. So anyway, the GTX uh, G4 1660 Ti has a Turing TU116 GPU with an expected 1536 CUDA cores. Aside from the lacking uh, RTX and the Tensor cores, the rest of the specs align up with the 20 series, the RTX 20 series. So I understand all of that, but uh, Ryan, could you give more specifics? <laughs> well, it's interesting. So there was a lot of people were hoping, funny enough on an NVIDIA side, that AMD would come out with something that was going to really push the competition on NVIDIA he- heavy enough that they dropped the prices of their GPUs. And I mentioned this in my video. You know why we know there's an issue with kind of a monopoly on the GPU market? Because NVIDIA launched video cards that cost $1,300. That's how we know. So they were hoping that this AMD coming out with the Radeon 7 was going to drive NVIDIA to react. And they have. So NVIDIA is starting to react now by releasing a much more cost-friendly video card option here for those wanting to get into gaming. You're not going to get the RTX tensor cores in here, so you're not going to have any of the, the advantages there. But it's a pretty powerful card, ultimately, and is more in line to compete with the R, you know, the um, AMD RX 580 and the 590 line. That's where this card would fall in. You're getting 6 gigabytes of GDR6 video memory, so they're not going with the high bandwidth memory that you're going to see. So they're not trying to compete up there with the Radeon 7s or the Vegas here. Maybe the Vega 56 would be a competitor. In fact it probably was what AMD saw as the main competitor in this price range because the card's only going to be about $300. Mm-hmm. 
in some cases as low as 279. So when you compare that to 699 for some of these new cards, then that is one heck of a good potential value there for individuals. But AMD has responded here. So depending on your team red or team green, AMD has now dropped the price of their Vega 56 line to $279. So that's who they're seeing this card as a competitor towards. They've now dropped their price to be in that 279 range. So it's a win-win for consumers. So ultimately, NVIDIA was out there in the news saying, oh, we don't care about the Radeon 7. It means nothing to us. The RX 580 is worthless, blah, blah, blah. But we're seeing that that's actually not the case. They are reacting. They're dropping prices. They're releasing new cards. And they're hitting that sweet spot. And this is where AMD dominates is in this price range here. This is where most people afford to, to spend about $300 on a GPU. So this is a sweet spot for uh, the market. And uh, it's interesting to see NVIDIA go out there and attack it. But they also have day one support, as we mentioned with their proprietary drivers. 418.43 driver was released at this, this week before the card's available. And so you will be able to utilize this card and its full potential on day one. And I bet it has UEFI support too. So there are some stupid things here that uh, mm -hmm. AMD has done at their cards in the past, but I I'm glad to see competition is happening in this arena. It regardless of which team you're on, you should be on Team Red. But regardless, uh, I'm glad to see competition. And Intel coming into the game now is going to add another layer to this. Hopefully, if they come in this year or early next with their dedicated GPU, this is only going to benefit consumers, as we said before, and we'll start to see prices drop on this stuff. And they need to. The prices are outrageous mm. right now for yeah. GPU. So from a, from a, you know, a, a basic user standpoint of view, um, and the, the the confusing array of numbers out there. So you've got the the GTX 1060, and you've got the 1080, and then you've got the 2060 and the 2080. Where is this 1660 going to sit? Is it above the 1080 or is it below the 1080? You know, we're going to have to see what the benchmarks on this end up being. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is going to sit below. Um, this is going to be above the 1080 line, I'm guessing, or maybe just at that. Uh, it's, it's hard to say, really. With that price point and what they're doing here with the CUDA cores, you, you know, mo nobody cares about ray tracing. So the fact that it doesn't include that really <laughs> right now, it's like, oh, no, uh, what am I going to do? I can't play Battlefield 5, which is one of the one of three or four games that actually utilize ray tracing right now. Um, but we'll have to see when people benchmark where this card actually lands. It looks like a really impressive offering, honestly, from a hardware standpoint. Yeah, based on the numbers, it's probably better. Just the number 16 over 10. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you would have to think, right, that yeah. it's going to be an upgrade. Mm -hmm. All right. So talking about video cards in our gaming news, one of the first things we're going to discuss is Vulcan 1.1.101 has been released. Now, there are a couple of things that I found interesting in this, why I wanted to bring it to light. There are two new extensions that have been released in this version. The first extension is the VKNV Cooperative Matrix, which is developed by NVIDIA. So this is kind of some of their work in the open source community. But then they have the VKEXT Depth Clip Enable uh, extension, which was worked on cooperatively by both NVIDIA and AMD and Code Weavers and DXVK. So now none of this probably means anything to anybody, but I thought the interesting part is it's really cool to see the cooperation between all of these different companies bringing in Vulkan. But for you as an end user, if you don't care about any of that even, the good news is this is going to help in translating Direct3D to Vulkan. So mm -hmm. this means we're going to get more compatibility in things like Steam Play and Proton with games out there running on Linux. This is specifically uh, related heavily to Proton because the Code Weaver team are heavy developers of Proton. The Code mm -hmm. Weaver teams uh, actually are the people who created Proton in conjunction with Valve and for Steam, and also they are um, the creators of Wine technically. So the guy who one of the the main developers in Code Weavers is the founder of Wine. And they put a lot of work into Wine itself. So the, this, this is a very interesting thing because the, the DXVK and the Code Weaver team put a lot of work into Proton. So having this uh, collaboration with NVIDIA and AMD to make you know, better support is only going to be improving this, their offering of Steam Play. Mm -hmm. But what I think is 
quite important for the average user to understand is that this Vulcan is coming out. They've got all this DXV, uh, DXVK. You've got Proton in Steam. If your game runs natively on Linux, I mean, apart from I notice I get a better frame rate if I do put the little Vulcan thing at the end of the launch. If you try and force that game to launch with Proton enabled, it actually performs worse than if it was under the native Steam. So don't just assume that because you've enabled Proton and you're running your game under it, that you're going to get a better experience. Play with the settings. If it's native, run it native. That's what it was built to do. It's only if you're mm -hmm. trying to play one of those Windows games that you should then start messing around with all these other bits and pieces. And I found that out with um, ETS2 because I, I can actually turn on everything Proton, run the game, pick open GL, and it wasn't as smooth and quick as if I just let it run under Linux. So just be very careful when you're enabling some of these features. It might not be optimal for the game you're using. Oh, yeah, that's true. I mean, if it's native, just use the native version. It's always a better option because you don't have to worry about any of these this extra uh, you know, launch flags and stuff like that. So if it is native, totally use the native version. But this is really cool for the games that uh, are not native yet. And it also makes it's it's really good for developers of these games too because it allows them to start supporting a new platform without having to put so much effort into making a native build. So it's a good transition period of getting seeing people seeing like developers seeing that there's a, a big audience who are interested in their games, and with Steam Play making it possible for them to not have to put as much development time in making it better so like well, they can get used to the, uh, being a part of that community and then maybe convincing them to do the native builds afterwards. So I think this is fantastic. And uh, the, the fact that it's being, the, the fact that NVIDIA and AMD are contributing in a collaborative effort, that is awesome because, you know, competition is important, but collaboration is probably more important. We don't have to fight, Zeb, see? There are, our two companies are working together. We could too. I'm going to extend an olive branch to you. And then right when you reach from it, rip it out of your hands and say, gotcha. I don't drink my martinis with olive. Sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> nice. love it. So headline news. Can everybody make a note of the date? Sunday, the 24th of Feb. Zeb gets to review a game that's not pixelated. That was nice this week. A, that doesn't run <laughs> in a That's my olive branch to you, see? See? Well, that's astonishing. I might have to start putting olives in my in my martinis there. <laughs> but Rocket League has a new update that is now out. Now, is this the same one that we were talking about a couple of months ago that they were they were testing and getting us to beta test, or is this another completely different one? It's a totally different. They they make updates all the time. This one is right. they they do. There's some things where they do gradual updates where like here's what's coming and they'll let you try mm -hmm. it out in a beta and then you can get the later's version uh, and they'll just kind of right. like test it out and stuff. But this was this was like kind of connected to some uh, other versions that are in, in included in what they were doing. So like they were talking mm -hmm. about having support for. Like they always made it possible for PC players to play console players, but it was typically only PlayStation 4. Then they uh, introduced right. Xbox, and then they introduced Switch, but you couldn't play with those individual people and until like a previous release that they made it possible to play against them. But you couldn't choose to play against them. It was just random. You mm -hmm. maybe get to play with them, and you have absolutely no idea what their console is, what they're playing on. doesn't matter. It, was, it just said yep. sign it, and that's all you could do. Yeah. But Excellent. what's cool about oh. this is that this latest release adds a friend system called the Rocket ID. And the Rocket ID is ability to add people to friends list regardless of what platform they're using. So if you're if you, you want to play with someone who's using a Switch, you can just add them on their Rocket ID and you can party up and play with them for whatever you want, whatever mode you want and everything. Mm -hmm. So it makes it um, it makes it so much easier to join in parties with people who, regardless of what system they're running. And that's really cool because there's a lot of games that have the ability to play with a variety of like cross-platform, cr like consoles and PCs and etc. But I think this is the only one that I know of that allows you to have all of these different consoles all interconnected with all the same party system to be on the same friends list and not have to worry about what platform they are to, in order to play like that is a mm -hmm. really cool approach, and I think every game should, or every game possible, they could do it. You know, there's there's some issues where you couldn't do it. Some games would be more, you know, there be it's easier to cheat on a PC game or something versus a console, or you have higher frame rates and it's not a fair comparative. But overall, any game that can do it should. 
Mm-hmm. So, Michael, you're oh. a huge Rocket League fanatic. If people think you're a fan of KDE, I would say your fandom of Rocket League is right up there on par with uh, with KDE love. And you're like a level, I don't know, what do they call it? Sapphire, Diamond? No, it's master. It goes from Platinum. it's 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 it makes sense for a little while. It goes for it's like just mi- minerals, but it's a uh, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond, champ, and I'm champ too. Uh, oh, you're ch- okay. Wow, yeah, wow. But uh, there's actually once you get to champ, there's champ one, two, and three, and then there's grand champ. And uh, cool. I'm not really close to the grand champ yet, but it, it's I'm I'm up there. I'm up there. So that's why you don't see us playing this game with Michael. It's actually a really fun game, and Michael helps us all win. But the problem is, if you play with Michael, eventually the system figures out after he joins your match. So the next time it looks for a new match, it tries to bring other grand champs or higher levels in to match Michael. Meanwhile, I'm here in level dirt or whatever (laughs) you start off with, and Michael's having everything. Yeah. Chump. Chump. Yeah, I'm, I'm level chump. <laughs> and so it's very difficult to play this game with Michael. But if you are at that level, uh, definitely that you'll see Michael jump in every once in a while playing Rocket League. And yeah. I, mean, uh, I love you're really League. good at it, man. You're I, really good. I, I appreciate it. What's great about this game is no matter what iteration they, they bring out, if you watch the experts playing it, it is such a fast paced yeah. exciting game. And the graphics are stunning. And there's never any. You know, the cars go up and they do a flip and a twist and he hits it with his back bumper rather than his front bumper. And there's not even the micro minuscule stuttering of the graphics. They are really superb. And this is how all games should be made. Not for the term. Could you imagine playing Rocket League in the terminal? <laughs> it, would be, it, would, it would It would look amazing. amazing. What are you talking yeah. about? It would, you do put it in not, Roush? Do not go and find... A Rocket League terminal game for next. So this week. is a call out to the community. Please send <laughs> them any Rocket League like uh, terminal games out there. But no, you do make a fair point. There's a uh, Rocket League is one of the best done high graphical ports to Linux out. I, I really believe that. And, and in fact, on my laptop, the Ryzen laptop I have, uh, which uses Vega Eight graphics, it runs beautiful on that laptop. 60 frames per second, not at the fullest settings, obviously, and and the medium to lower settings, depending on what you're doing. But for a laptop, that's amazing. And it's just a really well done game across the board. Mm -hmm. It has a fantastic soundtrack. It has great graphics. The concept is kind of funny. Cars playing soccer. It's a weird concept, but once you start playing it, it, yeah. And, and it's also it really cool because this game is a is a skill based game. So like a lot of games, you you can transition your skill from like a first person shooter to another first person shooter, and you're instantly good at that game, even though they're very, like different mechanics and stuff. But it's very similar. Whereas Rocket League is completely unique in the fact that it, the concept is absolutely ridiculous and silly, but it's also really fun. So like when mm-hmm. you start playing the game. Well, it's kind of funny because it's a lot of people who don't look at like the levels of the game. They might think that the game is like silly and not hard. Um, but because I, I had somebody send me a message saying that they stopped playing after thirty minutes because they became they got they was so easy they got like MVP within like thirty minutes of playing. It's like, well, that's because no one's good in your team, and or in the game period, like if you're playing. So like you you don't really, and well, as soon as they saw the level changes, they were like, oh wow, you can fly in this game. It's like, yeah, it's mm-hmm. not just driving around. You can do flips and spins. Yeah. And there's also people now who are doing ceiling shots where they drive up off the ceiling. And the way the mechanics work, once you jump, you have like 1.5 seconds to do another jump to do like a, a special dodge effect that the cars can do. But you only have that 1.5 seconds to do it. So you lose it after a certain time. But if you go off the ceiling, you never did the first initiating jump. So you have it forever. So as long as you're wow. still in the air, you can do it. So there's people who are going up off the ceiling, taking the ball, like flying across the, the, the entire field, and then activating their jump and just changing the direction entirely. So there's so all kinds of So as you can tell, Michael's stuff. not excited about Rocket League at all. He not has no interest all. in this article. D- it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't even matter. Like, But the it's one thing I want to say. Game. Incredibly what, difficult to get good at it. Exactly. Yeah. It's a really fun game. You will You will like it really quickly, but it does take a lot of effort to get really good at it and also a lot of hours i don't want to admit how long it has been but um there is one thing that's cool about it is that we talked about the graphics there's you if you remove all the cool flashy graphics it still looks pretty good 
Like yeah. even with like taking the bloom and the lens flare off and all that and the dynamic shadows and all that stuff, it still looks pretty good. So even if you want to get like the highest performance possible, uh, by the way, most people who are high level will just turn that stuff off anyway so that they can see the frames better. So it they doesn't do really... the same thing in CSGO. It's like yeah. they'll get this high end computer to play CSGO and turn off every effect in CSGO so they can get the best frame. Yeah, better frame rates, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, but do believe me, although it's a difficult game to play, it is such fun when you get three chumps running around the pit, <laughs> driving around the pitch, and the ball is right in front of the goal, and you go drive it and you miss. Yeah, <laughs> and your teammates start giving you how did you miss that you were 10 foot away you only had to hit it square and the ball shot off sideways because just your car was slightly <laughs> off skew. it is such a blast and a laugh to play I, I love yeah I love this game but there's also just to say just to be you know give a fair um, to be fair to people who are doing that where you can you miss an open goal that happens in every level like there are so many times where I'm doing these uh, and also there's sometimes in the higher levels we're doing stuff to make it more difficult to block, but by doing so, we miss the the goal completely for no reason. So like, there's an open net. We're like, okay, I got this. I'm gonna go really fast. Oh, I just missed it for no reason. It happens at every level, so don't worry about it. And actually, this funny. There's like a, a theme on Reddit where there's like a Rocket League Reddit. There's um there's a section where people were like make list of these like really awesome plays in these gifts, and then you go to another section where it's like, and here's where it, I could have been not garbage, but I missed anyway. So yeah, that, which is mostly when Rocco and I were playing. In fact, you mentioned when we and Rocco were playing before you joined. You know, you came in to show what like somebody good doing. We thought we were great. We were like, <laughs> man, we win every once in a while. We were jumping off walls, and you know, we had a good thing going. Then Michael's like, hey, let me join you, and and then we're like, wow, we don't basically even know how to play the game. <laughs> what like you know, your car's like flying across the map and I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> um yeah. So it, it is it, if you are somebody who's never played before, by the way, you're gonna have a great experience too. You mm -hmm. don't have to be advanced to play. It's just it does get up into the levels where you can watch pro uh players play. Um and you can watch it on Twitch. In fact they have tournaments and things yeah. like that. So there is the a pro, pro players make me look like trash. So yeah. Like there's, there's, they, they can do an insane stuff when it looks like, like what's really crazy is like when you start getting better and better, there's this thing called uh there's boost management where you, you know, you can have a certain amount of boost and you don't want to like lose too much or waste too much. And then you can watch the pros and they're driving two, three minutes of a game with like 10, 15 boost or something. And you have no idea how they keep it all and barely use any it's still having like massive speed and the momentum is ridiculous. Like I've been using, I've been playing this so long and I still don't know how they keep it up with it. Cause like it's, it's it, the level of difference between me first starting. Don't worry. Everybody's terrible when they first start playing the game. I was terrible when I first started playing. It's just like, it's such a fun game that you want to play it more and then you'll get addicted to you know, like developing new skills in this game. And, I mean, at least I did. So we can't tell you like it at all. Yeah. No, no, no. It's uh, we should we should just totally just move on to the next topic because it's not we don't. There's nothing else to say really. It's just like. Whoosh. So moving on, uh, there's actually something that we're going to talk about for the software spotlight of the week, and that is something else I'm also a big fan of, and that is FlameShot. FlameShot is a screen capture tool. There are quite a few of these. You know, uh, most DE has their uh, their own special uh, built in. Uh, screenshot tools where you just hit the print screen button and it, it'll activate their screenshot tool. Um, but Flameshot is unique because it is not only just a screenshot tool, but it's also an editor built into the screenshot tool. So when Ooh. you when you activate the screenshot, it will give you an option to you know select the region that you want. But on the outer side of that region, there's also some editing tools where you can add and uh, customly add an arrow to point to something or you can add text or you could change the colors or you could do grayscaling or you can do like cropping directly in the, the capture tool. Um, and, like, all kinds of different features that make this a powerful app. It's also pretty easy to use because once you just activate it, there's like these little buttons under underneath that you just click and, you, you, and it'll tell you what you can change with it or you can like quickly, quickly add text or change colors and everything. And the really cool thing is, is the really the, the, the arrow system. It doesn't seem like it would be that useful, but when you want to teach someone something and you want to point to something, it is so much easier than drawing like a circle or a highlight on it just to draw an arrow. It's like I'm talking about this, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. Like it takes like two seconds to add an arrow. It's really nice. But overall, it's a really cool application. And if you 
don't really have a particular preferred editor flame sh- or e- preferred screenshot tool Flameshot is something you should definitely check out you can even do like automatic updating to imager and all kinds of stuff yeah this was one of the ones where you know i you mentioned it as one of being one of the software spotlights you wanted to cover and I was used to always using whatever came with whatever desktop I was utilizing. And I went and installed it and I, I absolutely love it. I do a lot of screenshotting. It's just one of those things you're capturing notes or you want to capture a particular picture or something along those lines on your screen. What I like is you, when you select a region on it, those tools automatically pop up be- below. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to go through all these other interfaces to get to that editing phase. You can start doing things right then and there right. as soon as you select it. So this is a case where before I was using a tool that I just relied on whatever it came with. Now Flameshot is going to be one of those tools that, that I'm going to have to install in every you know distribution or every setup that I do with the new machine. It's a really cool tool out there. Yeah, I use it all the time. Yeah, it's 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 right. fantastic. And it makes it a lot easier to do it. I think it also comes like an app image or something, like one of the formats, like easy access to install it. Um, but it's it's so nice and convenient to once you start using it, you're not gonna not you know not want to you're gonna use something else like previously you'd have like a screenshot tool then you open up GIMP or something to edit it, or mm-hmm. you'd have something like Shutter that has some basic editing built into it, but you still have mm-hmm. to do the screenshot then go into the editor section then you go into the changes having it all directly quickly you can make these modifications and these changes and add these extra effects and highlights and all this stuff within like seconds of doing it mm-hmm. it's so much smoother, and in comparison Shutter is an awful lot heavier as well. Oh yeah. With, yeah. Shutter is huge. In. Yeah. Because I think Shutter is built on Python or something. Mm-hmm. And I think it's an old version of Python. So it's like really heavy. And then Flameshot is like super clean and, and uh, quick to use and easy to use and smooth. So uh, check it out. The Software Spotlight Flameshot. All right. On to tips and tricks of the week. So this one came in handy for me utilizing the new video card. Because one of the things I had heard out there was that this card has you know, get super hot or look out for hot, you know, AMD, people love to say, look at the old AMDs. You, and, and this is factual. They used to be the older AMDs like room heaters, but that's yes. not the case with stuff anymore. Used to be. Um, but one of the ways you could check that to prove everybody wrong is to use a tool called LM sensors out there. Uh, this tool allows you to get temps and voltage information on your system, depending on the Monitoring of chips available in your specific hardware depends on what things you can monitor with LM sensors. But basically, after install, you type sudo sensors detect. That's going to ask you, hey, what sensors do you want us to monitor? What do you want to pick up? Your GPU, CPU, etc. all of your available sensors. And then when you're done with that, you can just simply type sensors in the terminal and you can get a readout depending again on what sensors are available on your hardware for things like voltage, temps, and fan speeds which comes in handy if you're doing any type of overclocking or if, for instance, if you're just wanting to see how your system is operating with its current hardware. So this is a pretty cool tool to utilize and very simple and easy to run straight from your terminal. Well, we want to give a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us on Destination Linux. We love our patrons and coffee supporters. I just want to give a special shout out to everybody who supports this show Uh, that help bring it to us each and every week. And if you want to watch the live show, you can do so for just a dollar, which is darn near free. Right. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Kofi, Ryan. Is it Kofi or coffee? Well, it could be either one. Michael says it's coffee and I'm just adopting it. Okay, to be fair, I just want the translation thing. I mean, okay, yes, I do the pronunciation stuff and some things and some videos and some projects, but I just (laughs) want it to be coffee. I don't know if it is. It should be. I just think it should be because... It's just more fun if it was, so that's why I call it that. But anyway, uh, Coffee offers a nice monthly option as well, so if you want to be a patron, you can do so on Patreon, or you can be a patron on Coffee. And the same perks that you get on Patreon also come with uh, Coffee. So if you, we, when we post the unedited, the live show, we every time we do a live show, we also post the unedited version to both Coffee and Patreon. So however you want to use it, thank you very very much, and uh, you know whichever one you use, we appreciate both. We certainly do. And as we mentioned earlier in the show, please get back to us and let us know what you think or ask any of those burning questions via numerous methods. Now, we have our normal email, which is comments at destinationlinux.org. We have a Telegram group, our Discord group, Twitter, Mastodon. We might even be soon getting a Matrix um, server. Who knows? Maybe. But there's also loads of other ways that you're going to contact us at our website, 
for destinationlinux.org forward slash contact. So please keep those um, emails coming. We really do enjoy them. Yeah, and also the the fun doesn't just stop here. We we can you can go find out our individual content because we all have our own channels where we make our own content. Uh, you can find Ryan where he fills your brains about hardware and uh, you know all kinds of different stuff about you know trying Linux, all, all kinds of testing for benchmarkings with new Radeon Seven. Like that was a really yeah. that was a really funny uh, intro for his video too. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yep. And also check out Zeb's uh, content. You can find him tearing through some caravans on a Euro Truck Simulator. Or his streams on youtube.com slash Zebedee Boss. I can't believe I didn't say youtube.com slash Dosgeek. How could I not do that? So do the, go there for all the Radeon 7 intro uh, we, I just mentioned. And uh, you can also check out my content at tuxdigital.com where I release the uh, a news podcast called This Week in Linux, as well as occasionally some other videos that are not podcast related. Um, and also you can check out Noah. His show is asknoahshow.com where he covers, uh, it's like a podcast where he does uh, business and tech questions and Linux questions from uh, his, or anybody who just wants to call in and talk to him and have, uh, you know, if you have a question, he'll try to answer it as best he can. And uh, also remember to like that smash button and to share the show on social media. So everybody have a great week. And remember that the journey itself with a nice cup of coffee is just as important as the destination. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bless you. I know it. I know it. <laughs> it was just perfect right at the end. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. We can, we can do it again, or I can just. No, edit no, that no. Out. Leave that in. I think that's hilarious. Yeah. It's just as important as a destination. Gotcha. <laughs> leave it. It's great. <laughs>